Uh, in fifth grade, um, maybe you had this assembly too with the uh, the cop from the Dare program. Oh yeah, just say, right, just yeah. say no. Okay, so the cop at my school um, came in and he said, uh, heroin is the worst drug uh, because it's a painkiller so strong that you don't have feelings. And he said that like it was undesirable. And for me, it was like, this is exactly what I need. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you because you know she knows a thing or two. So now she's gonna break down Maya and Bialik's Breakdown is supported by Ring. Jonathan, what's Ring Alarm? Ring Alarm is a powerful, affordable home security system that you, I'm pointing at you, Mayim, can easily install yourself, and it works seamlessly with other Ring products. It works in one simple app, and for a special offer, you can go to ring.com slash breakdown. It's the perfect way to start your Ring experience. Jonathan, what does the Ring Alarm allow you to do? It allows you to keep your eye on every corner of your house, indoor and out, and see what's happening right from your phone. That's awesome. The fact that you can see what's happening from anywhere, any part of your house is extremely important. It gives you peace of mind. Do you know what peace of mind is, Jonathan? What is peace of mind? It's priceless. You can protect your home anytime from anywhere with Ring Alarm. Go to ring.com slash breakdown for a special offer on a Ring Alarm security kit today. You can build a system that is right for your home. You can have it up and running in minutes. That's ring.com slash breakdown, ring.com slash breakdown. Today we're going to be breaking down a different perspective on addiction with uh, David Poses. And David has written a, a really, really lovely book called The Weight of Air. It's his memoir. It's available worldwide. It debuted at number one in substance abuse and number one in popular psychology. It's really, really fascinating and it is a very different perspective on addiction and mental health and and the intersection of those things and how we treat that. But before we get into more about David, I, I'd like to introduce you to my favorite 13th step, Jonathan Cohen. Hello, Maim. I'm working those steps every day just to get to me. <laughs> That's the end result of all of my working? Correct. All roads lead to Jonathan Cohen. All steps. They lead, lead to the, straight up. The, very tall. He's quite high off the ground. This gangly Toronto-born person is the 13th step. Uh, this is going to be a controversial episode. Number one, the weight of air is not as heavy as water. <laughs> I know because I carry a lot of water. <laughs> not that I'm bloated. I just like, <laughs> lug extra water because I like purified water. Number two... <laughs> Uh, he goes against some of the uh, principles that you very much believe he in. He had a really bad experience with 12-step programs. Let's just say that. And if anyone has listened to this podcast before, they know that Mayim loves a good step, or 12, or even 13. Well, I, I mean, I and I'm happy to talk about this with him. The widely accepted way that many, 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 many people get sober is through 12-step programs. That's not to say that 12-step programs are beyond reproach or beyond criticism. Um, the foundations of the 12-step programs um, is something you can look up and research, and I'm happy to talk about it. Something we spoke about with Moshe Kasher yep. when when he was on. Um, there are there are many there are many ways to to live a sober life, and um, you know, mostly I think what. I'm eager to talk to David about is um, his experience with with mental health and and how science and pain, you know, in particular, different kinds of pain uh, ca can work together. We talk about 12 steps and they're not just for addiction. We've had many guests talk about their involvement in program and having uh, feeling the support of program. I'm not going to list all of them, but it is a, a common theme that has reappeared. The other thing, uh, if people want the overview of the mechanisms of addiction, because we cover that in the John Ross Bowie episode early on. So scroll back, uh, multiple flicks of your little finger there. Scroll back on that One feed. of our first episodes, I think, that aired uh, was John Ross Bowie. It, he's in the top first five, I think. 
and we cover addiction. Mayim gives a whole overview of the mechanisms of addiction and dopamine and how it all works. So if you want more info on that, hit up John Ross Bowie's app. It just the intro covers that. David is a writer, speaker, an expert, and an activist. He focuses on evidence-based addiction treatment, drug policy, and harm reduction. Um, his writing has been published many, many reputable um, places. He's appeared also on various TV and, and radio shows. The Weight of Air is called a memoir of a double life fueled by addiction and mental illness. It's raw. I mean, it, it is not for the faint of heart. You know, he was raised, as as he describes it, he was raised a upper middle class um, Jewish kid from Westchester, which if anyone knows Westchester County, it's a very specific way to grow up. He first got high at 16 and he, um, I mean, he, he was a heroin addict and, um, it's a very painful, I mean, it's a, it is a beautiful, it's a beautifully written book, but it is very painful. It's very painful to read about attempts at, um, you know, kicking the habit and, and withdrawal, but there's, there's a lot of hope in this book and, um, it's it's a lot of short chapters, which makes it I don't want to say like an easy read, but um, it it is it really moves along, and it's it's a really it is a beautiful book, and I'm very very glad to welcome um, David to my and Bialik's breakdown. Welcome, David. Break it down. I mean, writing anything at all is brave. Writing anything close to a memoir is exceptionally brave, and writing about mental il mental illness and addiction is a special level, but you've kind of reached the highest level and also it's in many ways kind of a, a confessional. I mean, you, <laughs> yes. you know, you, you kind of like you hit all the points and, and also like it feels really ridiculous to be like, thanks for sharing the deepest, darkest parts of your soul with <laughs> us. And then we get to ask you a million questions about it. Um, but you know, I don't know if you know much about what Jonathan and I do here, but we're we're pretty brutally honest, you know, in our own way. And I've been very, um, um, I've been pretty open. I don't think there's a thing I haven't discussed <laughs> that I've been through. I, you know, I, I like to say I'm a person who like name a diagnosis and they've thrown it at me at some point. Um, name a medication. They tried it on me. They tried combining them in all sorts of different ways. And, you know, like I've, I've had that cocktail experience. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a person who has sought to fill what we call the God-shaped hole with alcohol or drugs. That Those are not my things. Um, Jonathan likes to point out I have an actual allergy to alcohol. It makes my palms itchy. I think I might have an, uh, an allergy to alcohol, too. Um, I got drunk once when I was 15, and I haven't gone near alcohol since. I mean, yeah. it was just horrifying. Yeah, yeah. Not, not my thing. Um, I, I definitely... Um, you know, I, I use food and I use restricting food, you know, as as a thing. You know, it's no secret that we talk a lot about 12 step programs here. And, um, you know, maybe you can share a little bit, you know, kind of in a nutshell <laughs> about how you got how you got to recovery in the first place. You know, you describe, you know, kind of a, quote, normal, you know, middle, upper class upbringing um, ish. Tell us a little bit about kind of what you were like and what your childhood was like and sort of how how you found, um, yeah, how you found drugs. <laughs> okay, um, sure. So um, my my parents got divorced when I was uh, four and mom started taking me to um, therapy appointments every week. Um, I, I didn't, you know, before I knew depression was a word, um, I just, I thought I was broken, basically, like some of my earliest memories are of my mom, you know, looking at me in the car and saying, like, why are you so sad? Don't you want to be happy? Like as if it was a choice. And I knew that I didn't want to be sad. I didn't know how not to be sad. I didn't know how to talk about it. I was very ashamed. Um, and so I, I kept those bad feelings inside in therapy, um, but they, they figured it out anyway. And so by the time I got to like high school, they had tried every conceivable antidepressant um, and none of them worked. And in the back of my mind, there was this, um, uh, in fifth grade, um, maybe you had this assembly too with the uh, the cop from the D.A.R.E. program. Oh, yeah. Just say, right, just yeah. say no. Okay. So the cop at my school um, came in and he said, uh, um, pot makes you stupid, cocaine makes you angry, and um, you can't drive if you drink alcohol. And so, you know, it was easy to cross those things out. I was much angrier than I had any business being. Um, and I thought I was stupid. So pot was useless. And I mean, at that point, my lifelong dream was to drive into a tree. So alcohol was out of the question. 
then he told this very scary story about hallucinogens or about acid that um, I never took a hallucinogen after that story, even though I later learned it was not true. Um, and he said, heroin is the worst drug uh, because it's a painkiller so strong that you don't have feelings. And he said that like it was undesirable. Um, and for me, it was like, this is exactly what I need. So, you know, in my um, neck of the suburban woods in the, you know, 80s and 90s, heroin was like trying to find weapons grade plutonium, like it was just nowhere. Um, and everything else was available. And, and I, I tried smoking pot and that one time with alcohol and I, I just, I hated it. I, I don't like the feeling of being intoxicated. Like reality was fine. I was the problem. Um, so eventually I found um, heroin and it, it, there was so much hype built up in my mind, but like, I was pretty much thinking if this stuff does what I think it's going to do, like I'm all in, I don't care that it's illegal. This is going to keep me alive. If it doesn't, I'm out. I mean, I, I don't have any other options. I didn't know what else to do. And it, it worked. I mean, it really worked. You know, um, I mean, it is a painkiller and um, our opiate receptors uh, regulate physical pain and emotional well-being. Opioids work by, you know, flooding your, uh, your brain. You know how they work. No, but you, you, you can go ahead and say it. <laughs> Fine. Um, so uh, they, they flood your brain with uh, dopamine and serotonin and they bind to your opiate receptors. Um, they don't know, they don't care if you have a prescription, if you're using it to kill physical pain, emotional pain, like that's just what they do. And it seems like it, you know, for a lot of people, it's easier to believe that, um, people who use drugs are bad people instead of people who use painkillers are in pain. Um, you know, but that was it. So I was in a world of pain and it, it, it worked. Um, but I hated the lifestyle. I want to stop you there because, you know, a lot of us obviously have, you know, images of. Of, of heroin addicts, of junkies, you know, like that was the term, you know, that I always yep. heard as a kid. And, um, and, and I'm not saying this to point out, you know, how crafty and clever you are, although I'm certain that you're a crafty and clever person, but what you were able to Thanks. do was, as they say, like find your dose, meaning right. you, you operated at a, a functioning, I mean, a, yes, a, a functioning I, I, level. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because you know, I think a lot of people see like Breaking Bad or they, you know, like they have these perceptions of like train spotting or like what you see in the movies. And and the fact is um, there, there is a there's a, a, a and I'm not saying this to be like, here, find your dose of heroin. But I, I'd i like you to, to kind of explain a little bit about what kind of passing, you know, looks like in this case. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the thing about it is like these myths are so easy to debunk just in regular everyday life. Like we, we know that nobody can, you know, wake up at seven o'clock in the morning and start guzzling down rum and function. You'd smell it on them. Um, with, you know, we, we do know that, um, there are painkillers much more powerful than heroin. They're prescribed by doctors every day to people who not only function on them, but need them specifically to function. And nobody ever thinks like, oh my God, grandma's on, you know, morphine again. Watch out. She's going to steal your VCR and, you know, kill you. Um, you don't know my so, grandma. Sorry. Well, Sorry. right. But so, you know, this, this idea that like you can't function on heroin, I think part of why it persists is like, uh, I was functioning on heroin. I, everybody that I know that um, used heroin was functional on heroin, but we don't go around saying like, hello, this, you think that you don't know that, uh, people can function on heroin because we're not telling you, um, you know, I mean, who's going to admit that. So for me, um, I could function just fine on it. I was actually much better because when I wasn't on it, I, like I couldn't get out of bed. I mean, it was a disaster. And, you know, back to this idea of, of painkillers, like that's what they do. So it worked. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of undesirable, uh, you know, side effects. Do you want to list those just because you and I both have teenagers and I feel like we probably should uh, yes. give sure. a little bit of a disclaimer here? <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. So, um, I mean, for me, you know, my my fear of needles was uh, rendered impractical fairly quickly um, because of a high tolerance. It's awfully expensive. Very expensive. I mean, you talk about money in here like it's expensive. It's very expensive. It's very it's very expensive. No question. Um, I mean, the, the biggest danger with illicit drugs uh, is not the drug itself. It's not knowing what you're getting. I mean, like with, you know, if we had two pint glasses of uh, alcohol and one of them was, you know, um, methanol and the other one was hard seltzer and you didn't know which was which, like you're dead if you drink the, the wrong one, you don't get another chance with that. So a bag of heroin has, uh, you know, this archaic little stamp on it and there's no quality assurance statement or like, here's the potency and purity. 
you know, so that's really the danger. Like if I, if, and, and I thought I was being so careful with like, oh, I'm, you know, this is, I'm going to shoot a bag of dope and, and that's it. But if this bag is 20 times more powerful than that bag, like it's it, you know, lights out. Um, and that's, that's why people are dying. And that's why people um, during alcohol prohibition, uh, I mean, alcohol fatality surged for the very same reasons. So, you know, we, we think um, alcohol is legal because it's safer. Alcohol is uh, safer because it's legal. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would argue, I mean, just in terms of like mechanisms, there's, there, there's a very different kind of dosing procedure for alcohol, yeah. which is much more highly regulated. Lion B. Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. You know, we all experience stress and uncertainty differently. Some people might not think like, oh, I'm depressed, but they might feel like short tempered or irritable or like relationships just like aren't clicking. If that sounds like you, it may be a good time to talk to someone who is unbiased about your life, someone who isn't going to judge you or take sides. And that's what therapy can be, and it can do amazing things for you. Um, my mom started using BetterHelp and was really, really impressed with how easy and pleasant it was to communicate with a therapist. What BetterHelp is, is customized online therapy with video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. You don't have to see anyone on camera if you're not ready to do that. It is more affordable than in-person therapy, which is really, really important for a lot of people. And you can start communicating in under 48 hours. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash break. Join the two million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. That's betterhelp.com slash break. Mayim Bialik's Breakdown is supported by Third Love. I know what you're thinking. Mayim, you look so comfortable right now. You do look comfortable. I am comfortable, and it is very important to feel comfortable no matter what life throws at you. I'm wearing my Third Love bra right now. Don't look. <laughs> We put our bodies through so much. We push them to the limit for sport, for family, for fashion, or just for fun. And it's really incredible what our bodies can do. Third Love believes everybody's amazing and deserves to be treated that way. They design underwear, loungewear, activewear, and feel-good all-day wear that hug better, hold stronger, and support longer. You can feel comfortable all day long, no matter what your body faces. I work on a set where I have to be standing up straight and looking my best in clothing all day. And I have a third love bra that has changed my life. I'm just going to be super honest. It's all about the half cup size. I've been stuck between cup sizes for a very long time. I'm looking at Jonathan like he should be like, I know. Feeling is believing. Upgrade to everyday pieces that love your body as much as you should. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order at thirdlove.com slash breakdown. That's 20% off thirdlove.com slash breakdown. My and Alex Breakdown is supported by Athletic Greens. Life is really, really busy, and it can be very, very hard to maintain good nutritional habits. This is something you're much better at than I am. You know, I have a very busy schedule. I don't sleep great. I don't always exercise when I should the environment, stress, all these things can contribute to us not eating the right foods or leaving us deficient in key nutritional areas. AG1 by Athletic Greens is a superfood product that brings comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition to everybody and every body. One tasty scoop contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients. Join athletes, Life leets, moms, dads, rookies, first timers, and everyone in between taking ownership of their daily health and focusing on nutritional products that they need in the simplest manner possible. That is essentialist nutrition. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you an immune supporting free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Where should they go, Jonathan? Go to athleticgreens.com slash breakdown today. Again, simply visit athleticgreens.com slash breakdown to take control of your health and give AG1 a try. I don't want to glaze over, you know, the lifestyle. It was awful. <laughs> I'm just yeah. trying to be like really responsible here because yes. um, I I do know other people who who hid um, and functioned for years with a heroin habit, even sleeping next to people who did not know. And people are like, how could you not know? It's very, it happens when you've had the kind of chemical relief that we're talking about from the kind of pain, you know, that you were in. Um, 
the drive to maintain that, it supersedes everything. And I mean, it, it takes it takes over. So it's not like, oh, I like to party on the weekends. <laughs> like, you no, know. but it's, it, you know, the thing about it is like, um, I mean, and, and I, I'm totally with you on the being responsible. Like this is definitely not a paid or unpaid endorsement for uh, drugs at all. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think, um, I forget what the statistic, I think it's like 88 per some very, very high percentage of people. Um, alcohol is not a problem for those people. Drugs are the same, the same thing. So with, um, you know, opioids are physically addictive. So you're going to get sick if you stop taking them. Like that's a disaster. Stimulants, uh, cocaine, meth, crack, you know, all of those crack is addicted from the first hit. Crack has no, uh, physical um, withdrawal symptoms. So you can just stop smoking crack and 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 you're you know displeased, but you're not gonna be ill. So with with the drugs, what's interesting to me about the heroin is that like there was never um a situation where I would have um I mean I, I would have gone into withdrawal before I would have like you know missed one of my kids' soccer games if I if I was on drugs at that time. I mean that was the whole reason um to stop. And I think it's interesting how um you know there's so many people who run these ultra marathons and, and wake up at five o'clock in the morning and then don't see their kids on weekends and, and they get injured and, you know, they have all of these really bad consequences, but like, that's okay. And if they're doing that to, to deal with their depression, nobody, nobody blames the running, um, you know, on the depression. And if we would look at drugs that way, I think it would be so much more effective for treatment because we're just blaming you know, we're glossing over the problem. Well, and and I do I I want I do want to get to kind of those larger points because I think they're really important. But I I also do want, um, you know, to to kind of confirm what you talk about in the book, which was that the twelve step model did not work for you. You know, it, it didn't. Yeah, it, it did not work for you. It does not work for some people. Um, you know, it it. I will say that as someone who spent a lot of time um, in the rooms, you know. Th there are people who are not great representations of the program and sure. there are people who misinterpret the, the program. And also, you know, the, the program has a history. There was a, you know, it was a, it was a Christian incarnation, um, you know, but before it was established with, with um, Bill W and Dr. Bob. So um, there's a lot, there's a lot of room for interpretation. And as much as, you know, as much as we have a world service organization and they try and this, that, the other, and we spoke to Moshe Kasher. I don't know if you know Moshe, but um, he spoke a lot also about, um, you know, his experience very young in, in 12 step programs. Um, so I, Maybe you can talk a little bit about because I do want to, you know, make sure that you are able to to voice, you know, the things that didn't work for you. Um, yeah. I mean, do you want to just talk a little bit about it? Sure. I mean, for for me, it was, um, you know, the moment I walked in the door and they started talking about, um, you know, you're going to be dead in, in five minutes unless you put your life and will in God's hands and work the steps of our anonymous support group, uh, which really screams you have nothing to be ashamed of, um, <laughs> anonymity. Is that why you think it's anonymous? Because people are ashamed? Um, yeah, absolutely. Really? I mean, you know, yeah, AA, when, when, when AA was developed in, in the 1930s, mm -hmm. they labeled addiction a disease to reduce stigma. Sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, there, there's, there's no question. Um, I mean, you know, look, like my mom is um, involved with a, you know, a cancer support group, like there's support groups for everything. Everybody knows my mom is, you know, down with Gilda's Club. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there's a reason that we're not screaming. I'm, I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous, um, and and that makes it hard to, um, you know, mine data because it's so anonymous. But like Lance Dodes had this book a few years ago that um, he found. I want to say it was like eight percent success, and he defined success as the people who are still in the program. Right. Which is like, you know, anyway. Um, so for me, you know, I hear medical experts without medical credentials and magical thinking cures. And if you look up quack medicine in the dictionary, that's exactly what you get. So, um, you know, it just, it felt like um, there was no science and medicine behind it. And, and they're telling you science and medicine is bad. Like if, if you take antidepressants, I mean, there are the, all of these, um, you know, AA, uh, there's a, a, an AA group in um, Syracuse that's being um, sued for basically shaming somebody uh, into killing himself because he didn't. Um, he stopped taking antidepressants when they shamed him. So like all of that kind of stuff, it, it didn't work for me. I was much too pragmatic and they were just, you know, way too long on faith and short on facts um, for me. So today it's very different. Um, I mean, 
apart from like all of these JAMA studies that that show um, that faith and abstinence programs increase your risk of death, uh, overdose, and relapse as dramatically as methadone and buprenorphine reduce those risks. And, you know, certainly if you have, if you're abstinent and you have zero tolerance, you're at the highest risk of overdose. And the highest uh, drugs with overdose risk are the illicit drugs because you don't know what you're getting. Well, and I was also going to say that, you know, a lot of, I mean, I, I do take issue with you sort of I mean, I take issue with the fact that something didn't work for you and therefore maybe... No, 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 no. It, it works for... I know a lot of people who it Yeah, works for. I mean, I think that's important to say is that for a lot of people, yes. you know, for a lot of people, abstinence, um, you know, is a solution. And, it is. You know, yes. I mean, I, I know people, I mean, you know, I could tell you a dozen people who have OD'd, you know, from, from the rooms, just from, you know, kind of like my circle of people just in this last year. And... Um, you know, you're absolutely right. Very, very difficult also to quantify a lot of this. And, you know, for me, I, I love the anonymity of our program because it allows people who otherwise might be called out for being bad people simply for, you know, having mental illness, which is, you know, in many cases, you know, I talk about this a lot. It's just what you cover, you know, your challenges with. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But absolutely. But, but but that aside, you know, I think that a lot of what you talk about um, as sort of solutions to how we deal with this are are not as easy to to implement as abstinence, <laughs> meaning, you know, like, you know, and it's true, like many people, many people don't use God as a higher power. They use the group, they use nature, whatever it is. You know, a spiritual recovery path is something that's true. It's free and it's available to everyone, you know, meaning, Absolutely. you know, it's about it's about the books and the meetings and the fellowship and having friends who are on a similar path. Great. Um, but you know, a lot of what you talk about is a, is a much larger and m very, very necessary restructuring of how we look at mental illness in general. So can you speak to that m more specifically? Cause I think that's something we, you know, we, we, we agree on. Not that we can't talk about things we don't agree on. I'm just saying, like, that's, I think, a really important point. I, I think it's important to add that um, I, I never would suggest that anybody, you know, do what I did because that's how it works. I do know people that AA worked for. I think a very important difference is, like, the idea that, you know, a drug is a drug is a drug and, and addiction is the problem. Like, we learn at a very early age that every type of substance affects our neural pathways differently. So it so happens that Alcoholics Anonymous was developed for alcohol. Right. Um, I'm never around people who drink. I, I have this friend who's a recovering alcoholic um, and he relapsed and he called me a few months ago at like two o'clock in the morning and he was drunk and I didn't know it. Like I, I thought like maybe he had a stroke. I, I mean, it was really, really scary. I can't remember the last time I was around anybody or talking to somebody who was drunk and it was really scary. Um, and then when I talked to him the next day and I knew what was going on and we had this conversation, he said, you know, I think I just realized why AA is very effective for alcoholics um, and not for you guys. And the, everybody that I know that um, AA works for, uh, alcohol is, is the problem. Um, when we look at like how things are evolving here, like how the opioid crisis came to be, like we, we're a nation in pain. We're an instant gratification society. Um, we're very, very hurting. Somebody shows up with painkillers and you know, we're, we're all in. And so the question that needs to be asked is like, why? I mean, I think part of it is just by virtue of, of being this instant gratification society and everything is, you know, so fast, but like depression, it, it's not just why we hurt. It's what we're doing about the hurt. Like for 49% of depressed adults, um, antidepressants are completely ineffective. Like they're just unresponsive to antidepressants. Well, you mean classical SSRIs? Yeah, right. I mean, there's basically two kinds of, of antidepressants. And then when people are like, oh my God, like heroin doesn't work, you know, opioid, like, why are you taking it? Like, it's an excuse that you're in pain, but like they work. I just want to make a point that classic SSRIs, you know, like those are like the Paxils and the Zolofts, you know, the ones that your inter like your internist will prescribe you, which I have a large problem with, but I do too. Yeah. You, you know, those are drugs that work for a very specific kind of, of unipolar depression. The, the larger problem that I see, you know, as someone also who worked in neuropsychiatry is that Many people don't have classical depression that responds to SSRIs. They may have um, they may have some cyclothymia. They may have, you know, dysthymia that doesn't that also has some mania. I mean, like we're a spectrum. So the the notion 
like that's a rough statistic because you know atypical neuroleptics and some of the you know kind of fancier medications often do treat depression but the problem is they're more expensive your internist doesn't know about them and it involves you going to a psychiatrist which most people don't have access to and can't afford and i have friends on medicare and medicaid they can't even get to a psychiatrist so it's like this, the brokenness of the system shouldn't be dismissed as your choices are SSRIs or heroin. I mean, unfortunately, that's how it is for like, you know, these kids in West Virginia. I mean, I, I, I forget exactly what it is, but some very high percentage of, of depressed people um, don't have access to any kind of, you know, resources. And then there's the stigma on top of it. My MBLX Breakdown is supported by Sakara. Feeling your best really does start with what you eat. And Saqqara helps you not just eat healthy, but truly enjoy it with chef-crafted plant-rich meals that build a foundation for radiant health. I'm going to be honest. We talk about a lot of things here. We really do try and talk about things from a personal plate. I still think about how delicious. That's the flatbread. There's so many good things that Saqqara makes. And like, I felt so good about myself that I was eating things that were healthy and that were like consistent with how I want to eat. And they were so delicious. In addition to plant-rich meals, Saqqara also offers daily wellness essentials. They have supplements, they have herbal teas. I really like those to support nutrition. You can experience their best-selling Metabolism Super Powder and Metabolism Super Bar to control sugar cravings, reduce bloating, boost energy and reduce fatigue. And right now, Saqqara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order when they go. To Saqqara.com slash break, enter code break at checkout. That's Saqqara. S-A-K-A-R-A. Dot com slash break to get 20% off your first order. Saqqara.com slash break. My and Alex Breakdown is supported by Byte. I'm always trying to find ways to reduce waste and in particular plastic in my daily routine. And I also really value clean ingredients. We both do. Bite is reinventing personal care by making products that are good for you and good for the planet. What's their hero product? They're dry toothpaste? Dry toothpaste tablets. It sounds crazy. They come in a reusable glass jar. The refills come in home compostable pouches. You pop one in your mouth. You bite down. And then you brush and it foams up just like regular toothpaste, but with no plastic tube and no messy paste. My favorite product is their mouthwash. And you're like, mouthwash? How does mouthwash go in a tablet? But you stick this tablet in, you take a couple of bites, you swish it with water, and then all of a sudden you have amazing fresh breath and you don't have all the alcohol and all that there's Junk. no chemicals. There's no sulfates. There's no artificial dyes. Bite is offering our listeners 20% off of your first subscription order. Go to trybite.com slash mime or use code mime at checkout to claim this deal. That's T-R-Y-B-I-T-E dot com slash mime. I mean, you know, I, like I feel like we can, um, we know, you know, you break your ankle and like we know that your ankle is broken and there's nothing you can do about it. You have bad feelings. Like we've all been told to snap out of it and look on the bright side and, and you know, all of these things. So like there's so much shame in having bad feelings. David, I've had people on this podcast, very respected, you know, professors who were just like, I just had to shake it off. <laughs> you just got to shake it off. Right. Well, right. And that's, <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's that's um, I mean, that uh, that's that's really awful. Um, it's not a choice. And you know, the symptoms are obviously very invisible. I mean, you know, we, tr we try to hide them um, as much as we can, but getting good treatment is very hard. And with the internists, you know, prescribing these things, I mean, you know, I, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of, like, I took my daughter to the doctor because she was feeling sad and he was yep. like, try some Prozac. And, you know, the problem with that is the doctor is, you know, can prescribe it, but he's not qualified to treat it or respond with them. Um... I like to point out that like, I went to a bad psychiatrist for a period of time. And also, not to be more controversial than this episode might already be, usually if you're female and you report not feeling good, they put you on the pill. Like, that's what they do. Like, oh, you're 15, oh, you're 14, oh, here. So then right. like, that's also, again, right. endogenous, you know, it's endogenous all sorts of chemicals right. and hormones, but- Is that still true? That is, hundred percent. Oh my God. That's so gross. When, when I went to what I consider a more qualified psychiatrist, it was the questions that he asked me 
that allowed him to understand what was actually going on. Things that I never even realized. And and I think I've spoken about this before. He was like, do you have a special number? I was like, who doesn't? What's yours? <laughs> well, I'm a nine person, also three, because that's three, three times. I got a lot of numbers. But anyway, I didn't know. And so he started asking me all these things. And what he got to is that I... I had mania. I had an interesting kind of depression. I looked more like this than that, as opposed to just, we'll put you on the pill and we'll give you some Xanax, you know? Yeah, that's that's so awful. I'm going to clarify something because we get some messages and people are, can get upset at the notion that we're anti-medication. I love medication. Yes, I am. I also love medication. <laughs> because... Yeah. Anyone who's taking something that is having success, we are not opposed to that. That is not, and I'm just summarizing what we're talking about here. So there's zero miscommunication amongst listeners. I'm, I'm with you. Yes. We want anyone to find the solution that works best. What we're articulating is that there are ways that people can get help that are more specialized, that are more specific, and that the help that some people get, not everyone, but many people get is this very, very broad brush that ends up not working for them. And that's what we're sort of fighting against. We're fighting against this broad, non-specific brush that doesn't get the people the help they need. We are not opposed to anyone who has found something that works. And if you found something that doesn't work, we hope that you get the specialty and the special uh, skills required in order to get you something that does. That was the very polite Canadian way of, of approaching this. I'm going to take I'm going to take a more specific and yes, I'm going to push people a little harder. And I think I think David will agree with me. We live in a culture where when something hurts, you pop a pill yep. and our children learn it from a very young age because yep. that's why all those drugs exist. So for people who teased parents like me who were like, let's use ice for teething. Yeah, there was a reason I didn't want. To, to give my kids that kind of Western medicine, for example, when they were teething. And the people are going to be like, she's horrible to children. That's not true. But we are taught from a very young age that emotional or physical discomfort should be numbed. Here, have a cookie. People still do that shit to their kids. Oh, you're sad? Distracted away. I remember when I got divorced, I said to, the, to our family therapist, I was like, what do I do if he wants to? Th she said, you just tell him it's sad and you hold him. I was like, what? He doesn't get to write a letter. We don't make a phone call. She said no, because sometimes it hurts. And that's just life. And the resiliency to learn to have uncomfortable feelings and to know that you're okay anyway and not to stuff it with a cookie. When the solution that we are given is to take any pill in the absence of education, further resources, further support, understanding mental illness in a larger context, we are all robbing ourselves of the opportunity to progress as human beings. But the notion that we shut people up with a drug is not what any of us want. David's like, why didn't you give your kids a cookie when they missed their dad? No, I think I think there's probably a drug for that that you can take to, uh, you know, be better about not taking drugs, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, and my kids have said to me, why didn't you give us all that Western medicine? Why did you want us to suffer? I mean, no, I, I totally agree. And the thing that's that's so scary um, that I keep hearing about because that is is just foist on us and 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 kids know it. You keep hearing these stories of um, teenager. I mean, you know, my daughter's 15. So this scares me, although um, she insists that I've completely ruined drugs and alcohol for her forever. <laughs> You're um, a downer, which dad. Is, which is fine. I'm, I'm so happy about that. But um, no, um, so the idea, you know, the like my daughter, I mean, she's she's in like AP everything. I mean, she's like the biggest nerd in the world, but she's like the cool kid. And so she's got all these friends and whatever. Um, she's not the kind of person that's going to go out and like drink and smoke pot, right? Um, but these very nerdy AP, uh, you know, girls, if somebody comes up to them and they say like, hey, this is Xanax, your parents take it. It's from the pharmacy. It's not, you know, all this, whatever. Those are the kinds of kids that are the most likely to take it. And, and like so men, so much um, of it is now counterfeit and full of fentanyl and you don't get another chance with that. Yeah. And like, well, OK, I, I do want to I mean, we've talked a lot essentially about, you know, the <laughs> this much of the book, you know, the, the the big chunky part. But, you know, the real. I mean, you know, the real kind of beauty you know, of this book is when you do talk about, you know, 
it, <laughs> I don't want to say coming clean, but you know, it's such a funny expression. Um, you know, you, you found a medication that is typically prescribed for opioid addicts. Um, and I believe for, for 10 years, no one knew you were on it. Is that right? Except it was more like 12, yeah. 12 years. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you, you ended up writing about it for, you wrote an op-ed in, in the LA times, right? It was my coming out party. Yeah. It's, tell us about your coming out party because I think, especially cause we did talk a little bit about shame and anonymity. You know, I'm not going to ask you this dumb question. Like, why did you write this book? But what, was there some sort of decision about wanting to sort of bring this out? What, tell us about that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I knew, um, I mean, you know, the views that I have today are more evolved than they were 30 years ago, but it, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so I knew that I wasn't the exception to this junkie stereotype, you know? Um, I mean, back then it was like a homeless Vietnam veterans or the, you know, murderous heroin addicts. I never met, you know, a stereotypical junkie. Um, and, and I was, I just lived in such shame. I mean, I, I had so many, you know, more than a decade of, of relapses. And I felt like um, as the opioid, you know, I mean, I was on buprenorphine. I didn't tell my wife, I told her it was like a migraine medicine or something. Um, but as the opioid crisis started to be, you know, a thing that was in newspapers, I saw so much misinformation. And I thought like, you know, I, I'll, I'll start talking about this when it's more, you know, the stigma is less or whatever. And I, and I just, I realized that like my silence was sabotaging what I was trying to accomplish. And if I'm not going to do it, I, how can I expect anybody else to talk about, you know, openly about their, their struggles? And they're really, you know, I haven't read every single book about um, uh, drugs and addiction and, and mental health, but, you know, I was fairly certain that this story didn't exist um, or hadn't been, you know, put on paper. And um, I mean, I don't mean that in like, a, you know, well, I'm, I'm the guy to do it, but I just felt like that was really sad. And I was so afraid to tell my wife um, because, you know, no matter how you look at it, I deceived her for a very long time and that's not okay. So I, I had this thought that like, I'm going to write this book. Um, I mean, writing's always been my thing. Like I wrote a bunch of novels that I was too afraid to share with anybody before this. Um, I'm going to write this book. I'm going to give it to her and we'll talk about it. And you know, that'll be that, uh, you know, and, and that was, that was kind of that. Um, and she was, you know, I, I mean, I don't know why I was so shocked that she was so compassionate and understanding and, and, um, you know, really sensitive about it. We're still married. Um, but, but, um, you know, so she was so accepting and, and I started, you know, sharing it with other people. I mean, it wasn't like I was, you know, Hey, this is, you know, all the, I mean, you know, three years ago, everybody in the world, um, that knows me believed that I was 24 years sober and the happiest guy in town. For I think more than half of that, you were not sober. I was still on the drugs. I mean, I'm on the medication now. I don't think that I'm, you know, nodding off and drooling. I don't, I don't know what. You know. Anyway, um, yeah. I, I mean, my mom at different times, like I, I said, you know, either I was on heroin for like six months or a couple of years or like nothing, but you know, it was 16 years, and like that's that's longer. <laughs> um, so, um, so the the book started to like I. I um, I gave it to Andrea and I gave it to like a couple of other people. And it was just one of those, like, you should really do something with this. And, um, you know, so like I, I, I looked at, um, what do you call it? Andrea got me this book of literary agents. So I went through it and found, you know, I was like, I'm just going to find the like five dreamy agents. And when they tell me to go fuck myself, like this is over. Um, and obviously, you know, that, that didn't happen. Um, so the LA times article was, uh, my agent said, you know, you got to find like get an article somewhere and then we'll, you know, go out and do this. So, you know, she might as well have said, like, you need to win the lottery in all 50 states on the same day. Um, <laughs> so, you know, so I wrote this article thinking like nobody's going to, you know, I mean, I'm I'm very, um, what do you call it? Uh, you know, I, like, I think I suck. So mm. why would anybody care? Self-deprecating. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, so LA Times took it and they're like, we're publishing it on Sunday. And my mom didn't know any of this. I think it was maybe, you know, 24 hours before the article came out. I was like, you got to read the, this whole book right now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, and she did. And, um, the next, I mean, you know, the next day was the article, but after that, um, she came to meet me, uh, and I didn't know how she was going to respond. And I didn't, you know, like I didn't have a book deal, like this wasn't going anywhere at that time. And she gave me this like really beautiful pen, um, for book signings because that's how confident she is. 
Um, and I'm like, what the hell am I going to do with this? But um, uh, it was really surprisingly easy with everyone that, I mean, I shouldn't say that with everyone. Like I certainly lost a few friends along the way. Um, but the acceptance that I found is, is really extraordinary. And it's amazing the way that, um, that, that, you know, I, I find myself being received. I mean, I'm, I'm a very, um, shy and insecure person. So, um, it's like hard to even say this kind of stuff, sure. but like, I mean, just the idea that, that people are, I mean, I went to this you know thing last night, an event and like people, you know, come up to me and, and they're like, you know, I never thought of it that way. Like, thank you so much. And I'm like, oh my God, like, this is just crap that's in my head. With all the kind of like self-awareness you had and all the sort of information that you had, was there a time when you were like, I don't want to be on heroin. I don't like this. I don't like the lifestyle. I don't like the lying. Oh is there something else <laughs> like a medication that I could try? I mean, the, the thing about it is, you know, I think everybody does the best they can with the choices they have at the time, right? So my choices were heroin or suicide. Okay, <laughs> that, that answers that question. You were what we call suicidally depressed. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what it was. I was, I, I mean, you know, I was committed to either heroin's gonna work or I'm, I'm gonna die. Um, and so, you know, what else could have worked? It's an interesting question because- um, Well, I know what might've worked. I'm just curious your path to not get there because that's a, that was something that happened too. Yeah, I mean, I, I I hated the lifestyle from you know the 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 first minute I went to buy heroin. I mean, it's it's miserable. Um, but I notice, you know, I didn't think about it at the time when I told my parents that I was addicted to heroin. Um, I was too ashamed to tell them why I was using it, and they were too scared and outraged outraged to ask. And it seems like when drugs come up, um, people kind of lose their minds and they go like, "You got to stop doing it." Like there, there's no Nobody ever asks, why are you using this and what are you getting out of it? Because that's the problem. And so your question is hard to ask because, or hard to answer because like my trajectory is shaped by the experiences that I had. So my parents, um, that conversation never happened. It was just like, this has to stop. It's evil. I go to a, a rehab that tells me addiction is the problem. And I'm going, actually, depression is the problem. This <laughs> right. is a symptom. You know, because if you think about like the way that, um, you know, people like with with addiction is a is a, a medical, you know, physical medical condition. Uh, it, when I stop taking heroin, I'm going to get ill. Right. So the cure to that is definitely sobriety. I'm now sober and I'm not taking heroin. But mental health disorders like, um, you know, if, if you're one of those turn the doorknob 77 times or your cat's going to die kinds of people, you can stop turning the doorknob. You're sober. Your compulsion to turn the doorknob hasn't changed. And you still think your cat's going to die. So in rehab, they're telling me, no, 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 forget about it. Like, that's crazy. You got to just stop the behavior. That's the problem. And I knew that that wouldn't work, but they they explained it so well to my mom um, in this <laughs> non-scientific way. You know, I mean, they, they told her that like I was I was um, a, I, uh, I'm an addict and a drug is a drug and all that kind of business. And like she's got to you know get the Purell out of the house because I'm going to start chugging hand sanitizer if I'm desperate enough for a high. And I remember talking to her and just saying like, you know that that's not who I am. Like you were there the time I got drunk. You know that I like you know you know this. Like uh, um, and sh and she's just going, you know. But what if you're wrong? And um, that you know at the time I was like, what are you out of your mind? But n at now as a parent, I would do the same thing, like without question, because I don't want my kid to die. David, it's really been um, a real pleasure to talk to you. I'll be honest, I was very nervous to talk to you because, um, you know, I do come from a very, you know, kind of died in the wool, you know, 12 step, you know, kind of um, structure. But, um, you know, we we agree on more things than we don't, you know, and I really yeah. um, I I really I commend you for sharing so openly and so beautifully about your experience with such honesty. Um, and I, I hope that that so many people will look at your book and this lens with with more sincerity because I think it's an incredibly important part of the conversation no one wants to have in this country right now. I, thank you for for having me. Um, I'm I'm nervous talking to anybody, so you know I was certainly um, nervous too. I mean, it, the, when you said at the beginning, like the, this brave and all of this bravery business, like I see it the exact opposite. I mean, I hid this stuff for you know more than two decades. You want me to call you a coward, David? 
Yeah, I mean, it. what I did couldn't have possibly been more cowardly. I didn't say a word until I was ready. I held it all in. I mean, you know, so I hear that and I'm just like, that's, you know, and I, I don't mean that in like some kind of humble brag way. Like I, I really, I mean, look what happened. I didn't tell anybody like that's, you know, so, but I, I mean, I, I wrote this book with the hope that it would help people. Um, and I really, you know, I don't care if you buy it. I just hope people read it. David, if you were to suggest, because obviously I've watched kind of every documentary that there is about the opioid crisis, um, do you have kind of like a, a, you know, besides your book, do you have a top three or four other things that you suggest people either read or watch? Yes. Um, I, uh, um, The Fire Inside uh, is a good movie. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I have kind of obscure taste. Maya Salovitz, uh, I'm, I'm crazy about her on Broken Brain, and she's got this new book um, on doing drugs. I mean, she's great. Amy Dresner's book, My Fair Junkie. I mean, I'm not a girl. I'm not a sex addict. I am not a meth addict. Like, I, I can't relate to any of her stuff. And yet that's the most relatable, um, you know, drug memoir for me. And also, I mean, you know, like Jean-Paul Sartre, um, nausea is there's no drugs in it, but um, that is right on the money. Yeah, that was a revelation when I read it. I was like, oh, someone else feels exactly what I'm feeling. Oh, look at that. I mean, yeah, but um, and 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 there's so much, you know, once you start going down that kind of existential rabbit hole, there's um, plenty. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. First of all, I, I don't speak for 12 step programs, you know, at all. It's no one does. We are, you know, we're just a bunch of fellows, just a bunch of people who hang out together. So I, I can't speak to his experience. I mean, I read his book and he definitely he spoke to some people who I don't love the way they represented 12 step programs or sobriety. And, you know, that was his experience and that's fine. Do I believe that most, if not all of the people who use drugs and alcohol also have mental illness? Like, yeah. Meaning I don't think it's, I don't think that, and I've read the big book many times. The notion is not that, you know, alcoholism or addiction exists as this like outside amorphous thing. It's a reaction to living. <laughs> and, you know, what what the big book says is it's, it's not about drinking. It's about being sober. Yep. The, th the thing is not like, I love how I am when I drink, which, of course, sometimes you are a, a, a more palatable version. The idea is whatever pain I'm living in sober, I don't want to live this way. So anything that takes me out of that is what feels like the cure. So... 12-step programs don't work for everyone. That's true. And I I can't speak to his stats. That's not my line of research. And I, I, I plead ignorant on that. But what I will say is that we all find what makes us feel better as humans. Some people have less angst. I envy those people. You know, since I'm as young as I can remember, I, I've been unbelievably pained by the fact that we're alive that we're gonna die, that attachment is suffering. Like I had a very acute sense of that as a child. That's just been my existence. So I'm gonna find whatever I can. Usually being bossy and managing other people's behavior makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> I need that sound bite. <laughs> that's, that's my drug. My drug is nagging, managing, and controlling. All right. I think the podcast series, not only this podcast, but the entire series is over. <laughs> we thank everyone who's listened to any of our episodes. That's not because I'm a healthy person that I seek to nag, manage, and control other people's behavior. I know what it's like to eat my feelings. I eat my feelings. I don't want to feel what I'm feeling. So let's do this. Oh, I'm tired. And that means I'm going to have to start thinking about my day because I'm going to lay down and not have video games to play. What do you think video game addicts are? What I mean is... You know, I'm a person who, like, yeah, I, I'm a person who, who has depression. I'm a person who suffers from anxiety. And I don't just mean, like, oh, I'm anxious. I mean, like, my my, my hands are almost always It's been getting bloody. worse. Your, it, <laughs> your hands are not food. Yeah, I'm a, <laughs> I, I'm a person, I, I hold that anxiety. So when I feel that way, I want something to make it better. And you know what? It's true. For me, a lot of that drug is not focusing on myself and focusing on you, whoever the you is. And if it's a romantic partner, all the better, because then I can hold things over them. It doesn't sound healthy. That's because it's not, because I'm a human. What really got me in his his whole story was the when he 
tells his parents and the reaction is, it has to stop versus, oh my God, this person that we yep. love so much has been living in this- What's going on? Painful and, and just, uh, painful doesn't even capture it. Just like this tortured existence for so long. Oh, I know so many people whose parents reacted that way when they found out they were cutting or 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 that they were bulimic, that that was the response. It's, what are you doing? It has to stop right now. And if I put more anger, energy, attention on it versus, oh my God, my wow. kid, this person who I love so much is in crippling pain. Well, there's no structure for, but honestly, in our in our parents' defenses and all those people and people who still react that way, we don't have any other framework to put it in. And that's honestly like what I hope our show does, even in a small way. That's the framework. Hurt people hurt, you know? And when you are doing things that are hurting yours, it's because you're, like he said, it's it's what you're trying to cover up that's more interesting. Mayim, let's do a quick Ask Mayim Anything. Ask me anything. Ask Mayim anything. Yeah. Don, no last name, asks, what's the best alternative to antidepressants? CBD seems to work for my anxiety, but I haven't found much relief for my depression. Would THC work better? I mean, Don, uh, first of all, I'm not a doctor. I can't answer that legit. What I can say about THC is it, ma it makes most things better <laughs> because it's reducing the amount of focus you have on negativity, both physically and emotionally. That's not a cure for depression. I, I I don't even know if I'd call it a treatment for depression. That's kind of like saying, you know, is chocolate a good mood enhancer? Yeah, it's a really good mood enhancer because it completely takes you out of all the feelings you're having and you focus on the sugar and the carb rush. CBD and THC can and, and are used in, in some cases in medicinal amounts. You will generally find those, quote, better for anxiety, but I'm a much, much bigger fan of simple things. I, I'm just, it sounds like such a nerd. Exercise, finding an exercise that elevates your heart rate, even for 20 minutes, a couple times a week, it, it stimulates, it stimulates good chemicals that start training your brain to keep releasing them. Um, learning to meditate is absolutely proven and scientifically proven. Doing things like that are likely gonna shift your depression. Also, like, I'm just gonna say it, looking at what you eat and how. Um, all the things that taste good in the moment generally give you some sort of crash, which for those of us who are prone to depression can really get complicated. So while CBD is important and, and you know, chemically legitimate, especially for, you know, binding to certain receptors that that do modulate pain. Um, yeah, I can't really advocate THC as a treatment for really depression or anxiety. There's many, many other components that don't have the 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 side effects and the larger impact that acquiring a pot addiction will get you. And I'm just going to say it now. I think it's important to remind people about this. The notion that pot's not addictive really bothers me because you know what is addictive? Not feeling pain and not feeling shitty. So that's how you get pot addiction because once you have felt relief from feeling shitty, you're going to want that again. <laughs> that's like the that's the layperson's explanation to when people are like pot's not addictive. Watch. <laughs> Don, thank you for your question. Thanks, Don. <laughs> and we wish you well. If you want to ask Mayim anything, you can do so at BialikBreakdown.com. That's a website, B-I-A-L-I-K. Breakdown.com. Go there. There's a form. Scroll down the page. Type in your question or upload a video or audio uh, recording, and you could be featured on the show. Thank you. You know, there's a lot of levity that we bring to this conversation about 12-step programs and about addiction. Um, this is something we take very seriously, and we, we hope that everyone understands that. From our breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's Breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one and now she's going to break 